We do not seek attention. We pay attention. We are often judged by award committees. We question the fiction in science fiction. We are going places and virtual places. We are NYIT, and the future is ours. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tanner Slaby. I'm a first year medical student here at NYITCOM. Joining us here today is Dr. Thompson, a professor here at uh, NYITCOM. And if you wouldn't mind, uh, just take a moment to please like, love, and share our, our, uh, our post and write any questions that throughout this post or throughout the video that you can you know, think of. Now, without further ado, Dr. Thompson, please tell me about yourself. Yeah, so my name is Nathan Thompson. I'm a professor here in the anatomy department. Um, and I've been here for two years. Most of my research is uh, actually focused on human evolutionary anatomy. So a lot of my research really strives to understand the origin of humans, where we came from, uh, the origin of apes. And it particularly focuses on why humans and apes move the way we do and how that relates to bones and anatomy, or you know, bones and muscles and other aspects of anatomy. Um, and, and what I really try to focus on is, is why, for instance, humans walk on two legs, you know, what, why did we start doing that, how and why did that occur, um, but also some more ape questions that we'll talk about in a minute. <laughs> oh, of course. So what kind of projects are you working on at the moment? Yeah, sure. So I've got a couple of projects that all kind of center around human evolution and locomotion. Um, I think one of the coolest ones that we're going to talk about probably for the most amount of time today is some work that I'm doing with the gorillas right now. And so I'll use that as, a, as an opportunity. Anyone who's watching, please post any questions you have about gorillas or human evolution or anatomy or anything that touches on those topics and we'll make sure to answer them throughout the show. Um, so yeah, so I'm working on a project right now that I've been working on for about two years with some of my collaborators, um, largely from George Washington University, but also from some other universities that I'll touch on. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand why certain apes move the way they do. And we're trying to understand aspects of locomotion in apes. And I'll give you kind of a, a reason for why this is important and, um, and, and, and what we're trying to tie this into is, is largely when you look at humans, like you and me, right? We can study kind of how we move and how we move around and, and how we perform at certain tasks like jumping or running or, or hopping or doing any kind of thing you want to do. And it's pretty easy. So we're here in the human uh, performance laboratory. We have a treadmill, if you can see it in the background. What you might not be able to see is there are cameras up on the wall, high-speed cameras that are all synchronized. And, and you've seen this before. We can bring a subject in here, and you can have them run or walk. And you can put little reflective markers on certain bones and certain joints, and you can actually figure out you know, how their muscles are working, how their bones are moving, and all of these aspects of their locomotion. And from that, we can kind of go back into the fossil record. And so if we go back to Africa four million years ago and pick up a fossil thigh bone, a femur, for instance, you can actually look at it and say, OK, well, here are some similarities to modern humans. You know, this, this is probably where this muscle attached. This is probably how this femur was moving. And we can start to say some things about how those ancient humans would have lived and how they may have changed from then to now. The tricky thing is, when we go further back in time, you start seeing aspects of ancient humans that start to look more and more like modern apes. So apes are our closest living relatives, chimpanzees and gorillas. And so it becomes kind of natural to ask, OK, well, how are these ape-like features of their skeleton actually affecting how they walked, or how they moved, or how they climbed? And it gets harder and harder to answer those types of questions because we don't know as much about how modern apes actually move. Now, we know a little bit about chimpanzees from some work that's been done in, in captive animals over the last couple of decades. But what we really don't know much about are gorillas. Um, and what's really fascinating about this is gorillas are special in a lot of ways. They're the biggest primate. Um, they're also a very terrestrial primate, yet they still have these parts of their skeleton that are kind of adapted for climbing in the trees, and they certainly still do it. And when you go to some of the oldest fossil skeletons, um, there's one really important skeleton called Lucy from 3.2 million years ago. And some even older, you look at parts of that anatomy and they actually look fairly gorilla-like. So you look at aspects of the shoulder, or maybe the foot, and they, they actually, some parts of it look like a gorilla. Um, and so what we're trying to do is we're actually trying to, to go to gorillas then and actually ask the question, well, what do they do? How do they move? You know, how are they interacting with their environment? So the project that we're working on now is actually bringing some of the tools that we use in the laboratory, like high-speed cameras, um, out to the field and actually recording 3D locomotion of gorillas in the wild. 
wow, that's, you know, that's amazing. It's a mouthful, but yeah. amazing. <laughs> and um, so, but it's one thing to work in a lab and where everything's controlled and everything that you can do, you can actually change any variable, right? So when you're out in the wild, you don't get that luxury. So could you tell me sure, some of the Sure, yeah. So this is, and this about? is probably one of the biggest challenges that we've had in this project. And actually, I'll go ahead and, th and throw up a, an image that's on the screen. So this is actually a graduate student of mine, and I'm there in the background. Not the one climbing the tree, but the one with the hat on. Um, but a graduate student of mine, Kelly Ostrowski, who's at George Washington University. And we're watching a silverback, or no, is it a silverback? It's a gorilla climbing a tree in Windy Impenetrable National Park. And so, yeah, so it's very different working in a forest in the middle of Rwanda and Uganda, and those are the two places that we've been doing a lot of this work. And, and this has been probably the hardest thing. And, and since we started this project, people have been talking about working in the wild, and people have done some work in the wild, and it's always a technological constraint. I mean, here in the lab, we have power, we have cameras, we can turn the lights on and on, we can do all of this kind of stuff. It doesn't rain. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so there are all kinds of things that we can do to kind of control uh, the environment we're in the lab, but when we take it to the field, none of these exist anymore. I mean, working in Uganda and Rwanda, it's dense forest. Um, it's it's a it's hard to even walk around. But what's happened recently is there's kind of been this technological shift, and so only in kind of maybe the last five years have we started to get really small cameras. I mean, I think most people know what a GoPro camera is. These little tiny cameras, is we use a modified one of those in the field. And there's also technological advances in terms of processing. Computer processes are just much better and much faster. So we can actually get video um, you know, with, and bet, better batteries have been a huge part of this too. So we can actually record a lot of video in the wild. We can synchronize it. We can get multiple cameras all into the field. And we can actually start getting these 3D videos. And so I think another image that's about to, to be thrown up um, is another image of us. We are in, again in Bundy Impenetrable National Park in Uganda. Again, this is Kelly Ostrowski who's been working with me on a lot of this research. And so what we do is, you know, in the first season, what we kind of did is we just picked up a whole bunch of tripods and cameras and we just kind of flew to Africa and, and decided, hey, let's try this. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, there's a very practical reason for needing to do this in the forest, which is that's where the primates live. <laughs> um, so it makes sense that that's where you're going to record them. Um, and so the reason we decided to start this with gorillas, and actually we, we've been working with our mountain gorillas, um, is that they, you know, they only exist in the wild. They are critically endangered. Um, so, and, and as I was saying, they have a lot of aspects of anatomy that are kind of like early fossils. And so if we want to know anything about mountain gorillas, we need to do the research where they are. And so we've been really lucky to have some colleagues that work at the Diane Fossey uh, Gorilla Fund in Rwanda, as well as at the Rwandan Development Board, who kind of allowed us to spend time our first field season there and come and visit. And then similarly, we've had some great colleagues at the Max Planck Institute, um, as well as at the Institute for Tropical Forest Conservation, who have really kind of allowed us and hosted us and, and add us into the field to come try out some of these, met these methods with mountain gorillas. Yeah, for sure. I could see that this is more than just one individual person going through. It's a large group effort. But as we kind of talk more about the research, I'm sure, sure you're going to end up explaining kind of the rigors of trying to gather information. Working with wild apes, of course, they do exactly what they want to do, and you're at the mercy of them. So as you kind of watch and try and pick up data, you're almost just waiting to see something to hopefully occur. Right? Sure, sure, yeah. So working in the field is a very, it's a very interesting and, and sometimes challenging uh, place to do research. And, and it is a lot of, it does a lot of patience. <laughs> um, and, you know, we certainly had our doubts going into it, seeing if any of this would actually work. It was kind of a gamble. It was kind of a high stakes, high reward pr uh, project, which in and of itself is a really fun and exciting way to get into science. Um, so yeah, we kind, of, we kind of showed up in Uganda first day and we had our, our, our team and I, we had our tripods and we had our cameras and, and this was a very new experience for all of us. And um, luckily our colleagues really kind of eased us into the transition of, of collecting wild data with gorillas, which made things a lot better. But yeah, there's a, there's a lot of hiking involved, there's a lot of trekking around with heavy equipment involved. Um, certainly at some point later, but not right now, we'll bring up some pictures of the actual forest itself, um, which is dense. I mean, it, there are stinging nettles and all kinds of fun things that, are, <laughs> that, are, that you don't want to mess with. Um, but yeah, it's certainly a challenge. And then working with the gorillas themselves, yeah, exactly. They're they're wild animals, and at, at both of these at both of the sites that we've been working with, they've been habituated for decades. So in Rwanda, we worked at Volcanoes National Park, which is actually where Diane Fossey started her research over 40 years ago, almost 50 years ago now. 
Um, and so the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund has really taken charge of research at that site. And it's been going on, yeah, continuously for over 40 years now. Um, but what's cool about this project is that, you know, there's still just so much more to learn from gorillas and there's always active gorilla research going on. And especially with these locomotor projects, um, we're learning more and more and more. But yeah, we, you are, there are definitely wild animals. And so you are kind of at the, the, the whim of the animal per se. And, and I will say that there are, you know, you have those days where you collect tons of data and you come back at night and you're just so happy because, you know, all your work finally paid off. And there are other days where you go out to the field and you see a group of gorillas that's just napping all day. <laughs> and they do that for about four hours. And then, you know, we're only allowed to spend four hours with them in the field any given day. And then we walk home and say, dang, <laughs> um, hopefully tomorrow's a better day. But that all just kind of adds to the spiciness of oh, doing of research in the field. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, from what it's worth, you know, you actually have obtained a fair amount of data. Yeah. And, you know, I, I do want to ask you more about the emotional connection that you actually had with these gorillas. You know, even though they are wild, you have ended up spending a lot of time with them and you've had a lot of moments with them. Could you kind of elaborate <laughs> on? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so spend, you know, we do spend a decent amount of time with them in the forest. I, we, you know, a typical day is, or a typical week is probably four days in the field or so and we spend about four hours a day with them. So you definitely get a little bit of an emotional connection to them. Um, Certainly was kind of nervous the first time going out in the field and, and meeting them and being around them was a very powerful experience. Um, but you do, by the end of the trip, it is kind of sad to, to go. But, you know, luckily we've been lucky enough to get funding to do future trips. So yeah, good. <laughs> it's just kind of a, a, a temporary goodbye for now. Oh, I understand. Um, Are there any safety precautions that you're going to have to take, obviously, with wilds? Sure, sure. Yeah. So when we're working in the field, we one thing that we that we honor and is very strict in the field is there's a seven meter rule. Mm -hmm. So anytime we work with gorillas, we, we have to stay at least seven meters away from them. And this is both to kind of protect ourselves, but more so to protect the animals as well. Mm -hmm. um, there are occasions uh, throughout the last couple of decades where different species of primates have actually contracted diseases from humans. Mm -hmm. um, there, for instance, there was an Ebola die off, and I think it was in the chimpanzees in the 60s. Um, that was actually pretty devastating for that, for that group of individuals. And so because of situations like that that have come up, we actually in, we wear masks in the field when we can. Um, and yeah, we try to stay seven meters away at all time. And that's both also to, you know, it's their home, it's their environment. You know, we're, we're kind of only guests when we go in the forest. And so we want to give them that respect and make sure we're as, as non-invasive as possible. But in terms of health precautions, we certainly do wear masks. If anyone's ever sick, you don't go in the forest. Even if you think you may be sick, you don't go in the forest. Mm. And again, those are all just safety precautions to keep the gorillas safe. Um, and like I said, part of the reason that we wanted to start this project with mountain gorillas is because they are one of the most, if not the most, endangered primate. Um, and so when we're talking about like brand new methods, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the results and some of the methods, we really wanted to go after, you know, what is that type of data that we can only really get from the wild as kind of a test case for whether or not this would work. Um, I think there are only about, there's just under 900 mountain gorillas left in the oh, world. Wow. So about half of them are in Windy Impenetrable National Park in Uganda, and the other half are in the Virunga Volcanoes, which is where Diane Fossey did some of her, her pioneering work. Oh, that's amazing. So you're actually getting a very unique experience because you can only imagine how the species is going to end up turning out a few years from now. Sure, and, and one of the nice things about, um, about mountain gorillas is that in terms of a conservation effort, it's actually been really successful. Numbers of that's mountain great. gorillas are actually increasing. Um, Un un unfortunately, as when you look at primates as a whole, that's actually somewhat of a special scenario, um, and that lots of populations of primates are actually decreasing. Oh, that's unfortunate. Um, so, you know, there are lots of people that are doing really important work trying to turn those 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 numbers around, um, and and that has to be done because if we want to learn things about these these uh, endangered primates, we we do need to go to their space. We do need to learn about it. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of why we started about with mountain gorillas to see it as a test case. Luckily, their, their numbers are in, improving, but. That's amazing. Yeah. So uh, I'm just a bit more curious. So have you ever had any more uh, dangerous run-ins or you ever had any kind of, you know, fear factor working sure. with Sure, I mean, it was, you know, they're, they're, they're big primates. So sure, the first, yeah, the, my first day in the field, I, I can say that myself and my collaborators were pretty, pretty, pretty nervous. Yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> um, and there are, you know, some things that happen from time to time. I mean, everyone is kind of aware that gorillas chest beat, right? They do this big uh, yeah. dominance display. That doesn't actually happen as much as you might think it does based on, I don't know, watching the Jungle Book or cartoons or something else. 
but it's a, it definitely does happen, and, and seeing it uh, is certainly intimidating. <laughs> um, and you know, they it's it's their area, it's their forest. If you ever get too close, they'll certainly let you know with some grunts, and and from time to time, you know, there's a charge that will happen. I mean, those things are incredibly rare, and we try, you know, we try to do everything in our power to stay far enough away that those will never happen. But from time to time, sometimes they do, and it certainly is it, it certainly is kind of a, a scary experience at first, but. You know, these gorillas are, are fairly well habituated, so by the end of the research trip, it kind of becomes like second nature, and, and certainly some of the, the research assistants who have helped us out in the field are, are very comfortable uh, in the field as well. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> so now, if you wouldn't mind kind of elaborating on the setup. So you explained yeah. how you, you, know, you brought in some cameras, you hooked up maybe a couple of tripods, you spaced them out appropriately, and then you waited to collect data. How, sure, sure. how did you space them out? You know, yeah. explain so, some of that. And maybe we can even go back. Um, so what are we trying to do with this data, right? Okay, yeah. And um, so we're collecting 3D videos, and what we're trying to figure out, and what I have a huge interest in, is trying to figure out how morphology is related to motion, and then how primates actually use that motion to do whatever they want to do, like how they want to climb, how they want to walk. And the ultimate goal is, again, so we can kind of go back to the fossil record, find fossils of these things and say, okay, this thing you know, has this little nubbin on this bone, so it may have climbed this way more similar to an ape, mm. or, or this thing has a femur more similar to a human, so maybe it was walking bipedally. Um, and again, the problem is we just don't have good comparative data. And so the way that we, we go about getting that data, um, a lot of it is, is something called kinematics. And kinematics is just kind of the study of motion, but as, as if I ever slip up and use that term, what it refers to in this context is we have multiple cameras that are all high speed and then are all synchronized. And what you can get from that is you can kind of identify certain joints in those high speed videos, and you can actually see how different joints move. And then wow. later on, you can go back to, say, a skeletal collection, and you can actually compare that to the skeletons of those species and try to figure out how those things are related. Try to figure out how bone motion is related to muscle motion, how maybe muscle contractions use energy, how that energy is is kind of stored or released or otherwise used in the body and actually start to get at, you know, how much energy a primate expends when it climbs a tree or walks along the ground or does anything else. Gorillas actually roll a lot, which I didn't know before. Wow. <laughs> well, especially the infants, they just like roll everywhere, which was huh. very frustrating when you're trying to get videos of them walking. Yeah, of course. Um, but what we do is uh, we, yeah, we, so we have some tripods. Those tripods have some custom cameras on them that are mounted at certain distances from another, okay. from one another. And so it'll usually be two or three of us in a field, in the field on a given day and we'll kind of have a tripod with us and we'll be kind of lugging that through the field and we'll you know we'll find a gorilla group and by I, when I say we but that's really <laughs> the trackers that work for either Gun and Wildlife Authority or for the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund or for of one course. of these organizations that actually hires them because I would be totally lost no, you weren't <laughs> in the forest. You weren't going to be like Tarzan by the end of it. You know? no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, it I, it's amazing the kind of work these guys do. Uh, they're just amazing at their jobs and they yeah it's it's really impressive. I would walk off by myself for two minutes in the forest and be, just be utterly lost. <laughs> um, so they help us find a given gorilla group. We kind of every, at the beginning of every day we know which group we want to go out and meet and try to follow that day. Um, and then so we hike out to the group, which is kind of an ordeal sometimes. But we'll we'll find the group and then we'll just kind of stay with them. Uh, gorillas tend to eat a lot. Uh, they, For their size, I can only assume. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah and they're folivores, so they just yeah. eat plants all day. I mean, wow. they eat something like 40 kilograms of plants a day. Um, and I it will steal a phrase from someone else, which is that they kind of live in a salad bowl. <laughs> and, and I mean, that's very appropriate. I mean, they'll just kind of plop down in a, in a swamp or in a field that has a whole bunch of edibles, and they'll just, you know, just rip up everything to start eating it and then eventually yeah. they'll decide they want it, something else and wander off and <laughs> and go get something else and then just always eat so and then yeah so continuously. yeah <laughs> and and then eventually they'll get tired of eating and they'll take a nap <laughs> yeah, perfect um that's a great life <laughs> yeah. so so yeah more often than not when we find them they're eating <laughs> yeah. um and then we just kind of hang out and we try to kind of predict where they're gonna go and when we get a sense that they're about to move we'll kind of kind of quickly walk alongside of them and and kind of see if we can find a more open spot and set up our cameras um, and then when we do that, we, we hope that they walk by. We, we have a very low success rate. Well, very, I think it's very high, but it's like 10% of guessing where they're going to go. So, uh -huh. so usually we're wrong and trying, wrong and trying to figure out where they're going to go, but luckily we've had lots of successes. And so we'll set up our cameras we'll wait for them to walk by and we can synchronize them all remotely and trigger them remotely. Kind of set up our cameras back way and trigger them, wait for them to walk by. And then that's, that's kind of our raw data. That's amazing. Um, 
Yeah, so I mean, we're interested in, in walking behaviors. Gorillas do this, this kind of bizarre thing called knuckle walking, where yeah, they actually right. walk on you know, the back of some of their finger bones rather than kind of on their palms like most other primates do. Oh, I see. Um, so that's something that I'm really interested in. Mm. Um, other behaviors, they climb trees, uh, and so we're really interested in climbing behaviors because there's a lot of evidence that some of our earliest ancestors were still living in the trees and doing a lot of behaviors in the trees. Um, and so those are the kind of behaviors that we're really targeting and, and, and hopefully we see those things and kind of can quickly set our cameras up and, and record video of that. Yeah, of, of course. Now, yeah. I'm also under the impression that you did something kind of unique when it came to collecting data as well. Oh yeah, yeah. So this is, and I, I guess I should, should, shouldn't underestimate how difficult this all yeah, was. This, uh, yeah. <laughs> and actually, I mean, we can pull up a picture of kind of what the results look like. And I mean, this is, this is the first 3D data of any primate from the field that yeah. exists. Um, and again, it, there's a lot of technical reasons why that's been the case. The software just really hasn't been in place until now. The, the equipment really has, hasn't been in place until now. And what this, what this picture is, is actually a kind of a wireframe of a really old uh, gorilla crossing a road through the park. And okay. so you can see certain joints labeled, the stick figures kind of, uh, the sticks kind of mm -hmm. uh, resemble arms and legs, hopefully. And so this is kind of what our data looks like at the end, and we can do all kinds of things with this. Um, but yeah, this is really the first 3D data from any primate, and um, which is great because it allows us to answer all these kind of questions about morphology, um, and allows us to actually kind of learn these things and, and take them and apply them to the fossil record that, to a level that we've never been able to do. Um, and actually, this this um, this other question too, or, or I'll get to this one question in a sec. But this other video too that we can show, this is something I'm going to give full credit to uh, graduate student Kelly Ostrovsky again at GW, who's really been uh, putting a lot of effort into getting these together. These are actually essentially holographic images of of gorillas moving, and so this is something that was a method that was introduced a few years ago, but really hasn't been utilized a lot for some of the technical reasons that we've talked about. But we've actually been spending a lot of time and effort to getting it work, and so if it, if it hopefully it's playing for you. But what it is, is it's actually a point cloud representation of a female gorilla walking along a dry stream bed. So if you're seeing the video, basically every frame is essentially a hologram. It's a 3D point cloud, it's a 3D point cloud floating wow. in space. And so we can rotate these images, we can look at them from any angle, and what we're working on now is actually fitting a digital representation of a skeleton inside that holographic representation of a gorilla. Um, so this is something really cool. I mean, we've nothing like this has ever been done in the wild, and it's it's I, I think really going to revolutionize the field in terms of being able to really capture wild data on on any primate. It's this really this cool technological advance that uh, you know we're at the New York Institute of Technology, so I, it's really fun to actually find this technological advance and, and push it forward and and hopefully. Yeah, you know, push the field forward I mean, a little bit. You can't, uh, like, you can't kind of paint a better story, right? <laughs> you're you're working with you know animals that are be, uh, are endangered. You're going on the forefront of technology. You're actually doing things that no one has ever done. Yeah. And now you have data to show for it. It, <laughs> it almost seems that like you know you're almost setting precedent. Yeah for other researchers to go out and do the same. And I think that's you know, a wonderful aspect. Sure, sure. It's certainly nice when you finish a project and you have data to show for it. It's yeah, not always no, the case in course, science. Of course, of so, course, yeah, yeah. No, so we're it, we're all not all science works out the way you want it to. No, um, but to be able to see this hologram and then to basically, because science is all about perspective, right? So to be able to change your perspective through this hologram, to be able to see how things are moving and how things are going is a huge step. And of course, you can use this data for almost any kind of locomotion. Is that? Yeah, yeah. Right? So that's yeah. our goal: is that eventually we're going to spread this out and hopefully get data on all kinds of primates and actually be able to have a great comparative sample, so that when we go into the fossil record, we can look at it from the point of view of different species, of different comparisons, of different morphology, of different bone shape, of different muscle shape, and actually start getting a much better idea of how some of the earliest fossil humans and also earliest fossil apes were actually moving in the environments that they lived. You know be it six million years ago, eight million years ago, 20 million years ago, depending on what fossil you wanted to look at. Yeah, that's actually phenomenal. Yeah. But uh, I'm also interested, you know, if as a, as a student as well as a, you know, a future researcher, you probably had a fair amount of time gathering the research and obviously getting all the data, but what did you do in your free time? <laughs> like, how did you survive the jungle? How did you end up in, enjoying the time you were there? Sure. No, we made we made a lot of we made a lot of friends while we were there. Um, and eventually, I'll show you some pictures of. Actually, you know what? If, if we could throw up the next picture, so this is actually where we stayed. So we stayed at. Um, this was at Windy Impenetrable National Park. We stayed with the Institute for Tropical Forest Conservation, which runs a yeah. which runs a little compound right on the edge of the forest, and. Um, 
And the and days were busy. I mean, they were certainly, you know, wake up at 6.30, start trekking out to the field, oh, get back oh at 3, <laughs> and then look at data until 7 or 8 o'clock. But uh, the, the town itself is a, is a small town called Rohesia, but there are a lot of good, fun people there. So, I mean, it's really nice to actually get out to the community and talk to, talk to members of the community, both that kind of work with gorillas through tourism and through trekking and other things, as well as just other people that live there. And I, it's, you know, that's kind of by and large how we spend our free time is <laughs> is actually heading into town. There are a few bars in town, so oh, even better. <laughs> that's an easy There's way to spend time. always something to do, time. yeah, of course. <laughs> um, and actually, yeah, the, so the next picture that I'll show you is, uh, this is this is as we're about to head off one day, um, this is kind of right outside of where we would stay. We're walking back along the road, and this is kind of a typical crew that would go out um, in so the middle of the day. So my colleague Sergio Almethia has taken a picture. Yeah, but um, yeah, so it's me and our graduate student and um, a couple of people that work for, or Savio, I think is in that picture, who works for the ITFC. He was, he was helping out, us a lot, out a lot with this research. And two of the, the trackers that would, we would always go out with every day. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's a really fun, it's a really fun experience to be in. I mean, everyone who we've worked at has just been phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, Martha Robbins, who who is the one who's really kind of in charge of some of this work at the at Windy and Penetral National Park, has just been phenomenal. And it's it's always so fun because we're doing this new thing. We're talking to you know scientists and people in fields that we just haven't really experienced that often. So people like me who like to study morphology and how things move, we often don't get the chance to talk to people oh, that do conservation and who actually study primate behavior. And what's really cool about this project is. There's this overlap that that I feel like doesn't happen as much as it should anymore in science, um, and it, it's really phenomenal to be a part of that, to be part of that big collaborative collaborative project. And it, I mean, it's just even so funny because there are certain things that us morphologists just know, right? I mean, we read it in the textbook, we know it. Like yeah. that's just what we read. And we go to the field and we talk to people that study primate behavior, and it's like, oh no, that's not true. <laughs> oh, wow. I could have told you that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, and so there are just so many of these things that we just, you know, knowledge pools that just haven't been kind of mixed as properly as they, they should have. And I think that's one of the most exciting things about this research for me. Yeah, it's yeah. phenomenal to bridge gaps, to bring sciences together. I mean, that's, that's universally what you want science to basically be, right? Yeah. To solve the bigger picture of questions. Yeah, Excellent. So, yeah. I was going to say, we could answer this question perfectly from Bobby uh, Delacchio. I hope I pronounced that right. I'll let you read yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, what inspired you to get into this field? Yeah, so I, yeah, so I kind of had a little bit of a of an interesting path into biomechanics and evolutionary anthropology, mm. and so I actually started out undergrad uh, as an as an architect. <laughs> really? Yeah. So when I enrolled in, so I, I did my undergraduate studies at Washington University in St. Louis, and when I enrolled, I was I enrolled in architecture. And that lasted yeah, that's, about a day. That's, uh, okay. <laughs> um, because not that I have anything about architects, I'm uh -huh. an architect. No. Um, but I just realized it was a little too artsy for me. I uh, just knew that that's too probably... too architecture for you? Is that yeah, it was a little too... I didn't know <laughs> there was as much art in architecture, yeah. but I probably should have recognized that from the name. Um, and so I actually switched to civil engineering. And so mm -hmm. my undergraduate degree is actually in civil engineering. Oh, wow. Um, and as I kind of progressed through civil engineering, I kind of... I realized that maybe that wasn't quite the field for me, and I got more and more mm. interested in anthropology. And it's what's kind of crazy about that is that it's a lot of the same stuff. <laughs> so, oh, wow. so how you design a building, right, is actually kind of very similar to how you would go about analyzing a biological system, like a human. So, mm. in, but instead of having you know, columns and beams and bolts in a building, you're actually looking at bones and joints and ligaments in a human. But yeah. a lot of the skill sets are all the same. A lot of the kind of engineering principles that go into designing a car or building you use in, in biomechanics. So, I mean, it's got the word mechanics. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so after I graduated um, undergrad, I took a year off and I got more and more interested in anthropology and I eventually enrolled at, enrolled at Stony Brook, which is where I did my PhD. And so that's kind of how I got into uh, anthropology. So it was kind of a, a, a backwards way to approach yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> very interesting. But hey, I'm, I'm glad but you yeah. found your, your niche. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, not to play, a, a, you know, a pun on words, but this opened up a gateway to basically what you're doing now, right? So how did you end up working with animals, right? So in anthropology, you can go into marine biology, you can go into, you know, there are other professors here that are, do other research with other unique animals. You know, how did you end up with apes? Sure, sure. So I was, uh, the reason for kind of focusing on apes now is, I mean, I was just always kind of interested in, in human evolution. I mean, I had mm -hmm. always loved biology and I loved fossils as a kid, but 
Um, I think there's something about studying human origins that's just really, uh, really kind of special. And I mean, I, the way I kind of tell this to people is, I mean, everyone has at some point thought about where they come from. I mean, every, yeah. every religion has an origin story. Everyone at some point has tried to figure out, you know, what does life mean? Where do we come from? Of course. And I think it's just this kind of innate question to humans. And so there's something really, uh, really special, I think, about kind of being able to answer that question and, and really looking at these, these aspects of kind of the earliest humans that ever existed. You know, what did they do? How did they move? What did they look like? And to kind of answer those questions, you, you just, you need to look at our closest living relatives, which are chimpanzees and, and gorillas. And so that's kind of how I got into working um, with apes. And, and the way we got into working with gorillas through this project is we had a collaborator at GW, Shannon McFarlane, who has been working with the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. And she's actually curating skeletons of apes that have died, um, of wow. gorillas that have died. And, um, and making some really great museums in both Rwanda and Uganda. And so uh, my co-PI, my co-principal investigator, Sergio, and I we were talking about this project and brainstorming this project, and she kind of just said, like, hey, why don't you just come try this? <laughs> and we're like, yeah, you know, that sounds like it'd be a lot of fun. I mean, it'd be hard, but it sounds like a lot of fun. And, and I think she kind of was like, no, I mean, seriously, like, let's, let's do, do it this, this summer. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, she kind of gave us the oomph that we needed to That's get out into the field awesome. and actually try it. And it's, and it's worked out really well so far. Um, so did you ever imagine it being so physically demanding to be an anthropologist? Uh, <laughs> <basically> no. <laughs> got, yeah. Um, but course. I'm glad it is. I was yeah. always into hiking and into outdoors uh, and so and into camping. So yeah. I'm actually, I love it because I, you know, most of my time is spent kind of at a computer screen because screen, once we get all these videos, we have to bring them back to the lab and actually watch them all and digitize them and it's hours spent in front of a computer yeah. screen. So I, I love the opportunity to, to actually get out into the forest and actually work with these animals and it's kind of a break from the, yeah. the otherwise lab work that ends up happening. <laughs> no, that's, that's phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, you know, trying to get the environmental aspect into it as well, you know, you get to enjoy something that not many people can enjoy. You get to have a unique experience kind of hiking, trekking and making your way through it. Sure. And I'm sure as we go through more photos <laughs> coming up, you know, yeah. you, we'll be able to see like the beauty of, you know, the environments you get to. Yeah, sure. It's, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's definitely a benefit of this kind of research. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's great. And I, you know, I think that's, it's phenomenal. Yeah. So, but one kind of question is, is a bit, it, it makes me question, how did you get into teaching then? If you oh, were yeah. so into anthropology, you know sure. what I mean? Yeah, no, that's so, a good question. So I, yeah, I study evolutionary anthropology. I study anatomy, um, but I teach at a medical school, right? Yes. So right, we're here at NYT College of Osteopathic Medicine. And I think that's a natural question is, what are you doing here? Um, and so the reason that, that, that I teach in anatomy is, A, I love anatomy. Um, but part of the reason that I teach it is because, you know, when I teach, you know, future doctors like you, what, we, what we're looking at is we want this kind of integrative idea of how the body works. So when we go through anatomy, we teach you what all the bones are. We teach you what all the muscles are. You have lectures for me on how, you know, the functional morphology of the lower limb, how the muscles and bones interact to create motion. And, and that's something that, that we as evolutionary anthropologists and as evolutionary biologists really spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, and kind of what I said earlier is, you know, we, at the end of the day, you look at a fossil and you just have this bone. I mean, it's the worst, <laughs> it's the worst evidence ever. I, yeah. it's, it, most of the time it's broken, it's shattered, yeah. you have to like reconstruct parts of it. It's just terrible evidence. But what we do is we take it and it's like, okay, well, what do we know? And we know this about human anatomy and we know this about chimpanzee anatomy and we know this about other primate anatomy. And we start to kind of build this comparative picture and, and what we end up learning through all, all of that is not only what human anatomy looks like, but what anatomy in a lot of other animals looks like too. And so what I think makes that special about having uh, evolutionary anthropologists in the anatomy department, which is something yeah. that NYTCOM is great we about, have, yeah, we have of tons of evolutionary abundance. biologists, uh, yeah. is we can not only teach you just the physical structure of anatomy, but can add fun things in, you know, like, well, you know, you have these muscles in your feet that you don't ever use for anything. Yeah. And the reason why is because you don't have a big toe that grasps anything anymore, <laughs> so you don't need them, mm. but they're still there. And so we can actually kind of contextualize what we're learning in the anatomy lab. And I think kind of more broadly too, as well as that, I mean, medicine is inherently this field of hypotheses. So, you know, when you see a patient, you're ultimately going to, you know, say, okay, he comes in, he's coughing, he's got diarrhea, he's got X, Y, and Z. And you'll try to figure out what he has. And, and doing that involves ruling out certain conditions based on certain criteria, and then maybe supporting some hypotheses for another condition based on another criteria. And that's something that we're trying to do in med school is, is go through that process of, you know, how do you test this idea? And that's something that, that people like me are really 
think about a lot is yeah, you know how you know I have this idea for what this how this fossil might have moved, but what do I need to test that idea? Oh, yeah. Wow. So that's another kind of in, no, no, another that way that we're trying 100%. to get. As a medical yeah. student, yeah, that's what we always play with. We play with different differentials, how to support it, pertinent positives and yeah. negatives, working through it. So it's amazing. So you have your independent research. You're able to teach anatomy. You're able to bridge the gap. You know, makes you a great asset to the NYIT comp. So, but. Do you actually do any research with students here as well? Sure, yeah. Oh, as, wow. as you know, oh, as, as I would <laughs> Tanner, know. you're one of our uh, one of the great uh, <laughs> research assistants yeah. here in the company. Yeah, so we do a lot of research. Myself and, and other members of anatomy and other members of the faculty too. We do all kinds of research um, with students that that both kind of tend a little bit more to the evolutionary side, things that I'm more interested in, mm. but also a little bit more to the medical side. And, and we're going to be working on a project this summer that kind of is right at the boundary of those two things. And it's, oh, it's not really? related to gorillas at all. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, get on that, right? Oh, um, <laughs> but it's actually looking at some organs in the inner ear, uh, mm. or in the head, that are, that are the inner ear organs. So these are the organs that make you car sick, right? So if you're driving along, yeah. you get car sick. because yeah. everyone always says, oh, it's fluid in the ear. Well, this is what we're going to look at. Um, and what we're going to try to figure out is, is why the shape of that changes. And so what's kind of interesting is the shape of that organ, you know, vertebrates have this organ. This organ's been around for hundreds of millions of years. It's really old, it's really mm -hmm. ancient, but the shape changes. And people try to use the shape of the indentation that's left in fossils to reconstruct aspects of locomotion, and including human locomotion. Um, and so what we're gonna do is try to test some ideas regarding how that links to head motion and what we can and can't say about uh, how humans actually find their way in their environment based on those those organs. Oh, so cool. yeah, there's all kinds of cool projects that we do in NYT. No, that's, that's great. <laughs> no, I, and it, it shows you know the diversity of one your palette and of course the NYIT comp. Now, I'm sure you're you're a huge proponent of getting other people out to do research with you. And you know how do you, how important is it to you to basically allow students to do research, to kind of build that community for yourself going forward. Yeah, I think it's enormously important to get students involved in research. Um, I think research provides a lot of that kind of hands-on knowledge that that is harder to get through lecture-based classes. Um, I mean, especially, I mean, med school is a good example of this, but oh, of it course. extends to all kinds of education that, you know, a lot of people's entrance into education is through lecture. I mean, this is what yeah. we get essentially from first grade on. Mm. And we get told this is the information that's in the book. This is how know it works. It, this is, it. yeah, and once forward. you know it, that's it. And, you know, at some point, it, it helps to be acquainted with this idea that, you know, these are just, this is just science as we now know it. You know, some of these ideas are really well supported, and everyone agrees that two plus two equals four. But then when you get into kind of higher levels of, of, of science, like working with primates or anthropology, you, you start to realize that some of those, you know, some of those ideas are just the ideas of the time, and actually, some of these are hypotheses that we can actually test. And so, science very much becomes a process, and not so much just learning it. And I think getting people to that point where they're starting to kind of question what they know, but also say, okay, well, I have this idea. How do I actually test it? Is something that's really useful to have. Um, and so that's why I really like getting medical students interested in research. We're going to work with some high schoolers this summer, and that's why I want to get some even some high schools uh, involved with research because the earlier you get exposed to idea, this idea that it's a process, I think it's 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 better in terms of yeah. learning things down the road. Start them young. That's the best way to do it, right? Yeah. So I guess we're going to move on to questions now. Yeah. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, Briley K asks, why would working in the wild be preferable to a lab? Sure. Um, yeah, so all the research that we're doing now is working in the wild. Um, there are a couple different ways that you can get at some of these, these questions about animal locomotion. And uh, one of them is in a lab, the other is in ca other captive environments like zoos. And the reason that we're, you know, some of those, those environments aren't always the best. Um, having primates in a lab, there always raises some ethical concerns, but also you're just limited. I mean, you're limited into the actual species that you can study. You're limited in, in what, in the surroundings, what it looks like. And even in the zoo, sometimes you're limited in numbers, numbers of species. You know, the environment is ultimately somewhat artificial. I mean, zoos do a very good job of trying to keep things as natural and, and stimulating for the animals as possible. But it's just not the wild. They're not doing the same thing. Of course. And I think one kind of good example of this is um, back to mountain gorillas. They've kind of been known as they're terrestrial. They walk on the ground. Yeah. And, and this has just kind of been it. I mean, this is the knowledge that, again, you're going to read in the textbook. They very rarely climb. And what's kind of interesting about that is when you look at the mountain gorillas in Uganda, they actually do climb a lot. Uh, you know, it, they spend most of the time on the ground, but they, they still climb a lot. And, and again, it's, 
you would never know that necessarily if you just look at zoos. So you, you kind of have access to more animals and more information. You actually see what these things do and you see the kind of pressures that are on them in terms of evolutionary pressures and environmental pressures um, that you won't necessarily see in, in captive environments. Well, it's, I mean, phenomenally that you took the first steps to gather this data it kind of illustrates to people going forward in, you know, in anthropology that it can be done sure, and it yeah. should be done and it has its benefits. It's, yeah, it's fantastic. Sure. So uh, Dost asks, what are some of the advantages of using modified GoPros compared to a regular GoPro? Sure, yeah. So we use, yeah, we use these little modified GoPros. And, and if you have a GoPro out there, I mean, you, you record video and it's this super fisheye distorted, mm. distorted view of what's going on. So we actually work with a company in Canada that actually takes, kind of scraps them down, takes the lenses off, puts nice lenses on them. Um, and they're actually interchangeable. So you can actually take a camera lens off of a DSLR at home and, and throw it on there. And this kind of affects the more technical part of, of the analysis too, because once we actually get all the video from the field and bring it back to the lab, the next step we do is called calibration. And this kind of mm -hmm. takes a while, but you basically try to track some points that you can see in all the cameras, you link them up, and then there are algorithms that you can use to actually create a 3D space. Wow. So you, you put the cameras all in this 3D space, but some of these, how you do that is kind of very dependent on aspects of the lens and other technical mm -hmm. aspects of the camera. So being able to customize that kind of stuff actually makes the calibration much easier. And, and that's actually kind of why more recently this research has been easier to do. Certainly there are, are people that have, have brought cameras out to the wild before and recorded 2D locomotion. And, and in, in one case before us in, in New World Monkeys in South America, 3D locomotion. But it's always kind of been limited by camera technology. But the fact that you can actually get these GoPros now for a couple hundred bucks, you can get them scrapped down and, and, and actually make them into really cool scientific tools and, and do these fancy calibrations on, on a fairly shoestring budget <laughs> is, is really opened the door in terms of what, what is and isn't possible. That's phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, moving forward in technology is probably going to be one of the greatest advancements for science in general. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, Alex Wang asks, is there any place where we can watch your 3D videos of gorillas? I would say not yet. Alex, if you're out there, wait we'll a little bit, um, because we're, we're still working on publishing all this stuff, and eventually it will be online. So we'll, we'll put it online in supplemental material in terms of publications. We'll also hopefully have some kind of database where we can, we can put all this information, and you can go home and you can watch it and look at it too. and Make your own hypothesis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you can look about Basically it and say, Basically contradict Thompson yeah, and, and totally you, make him a horrible professor. Sure, yeah. yeah exactly you always gotta, you gotta be coming up with new hypotheses. You can look at, can look at the video and notice something that maybe no one else had noticed before. So perfect. So so stay stay tuned stay for that. Stay tuned after publication. Stay yeah. tuned. <laughs> so Kim Tucker asks, how does studying endangered animals potentially help conservation efforts? Yeah, good sure. Um, that is a very good question because yeah, like I said, um, mountain gorillas are very endangered, and and so are lots of other primates. Mm. And one of the ways that it helps conservation areas uh, or efforts is that it's a, it's a venue uh, by which to A, promote conservation work, but also there have been a handful of studies that actually shows that opening up primate populations to research actually uh, improves conservation efforts as well. Um, so kind of being there, making the, pop, you know, the population, the general population more aware of the fact that these primates still exist, people are still studying, there's still all kinds of cool stuff that we're doing with them. I mean, we're still learning all kinds of fun things about gorillas, even though they've been studied for, you know, 50 years. And, and so bringing that to the forefront of public attention really helps, um, really helps conservation efforts just because people are aware of them and they're, they're more willing to see them and, and kind of donate money to causes or go out and, and you can actually visit these mountain gorillas, you can actually take tours of the sites. Um, all of, and a lot of that money goes to help protect the sites as well. So, so it's kind of a positive feedback. Oh, good. Yeah. I'm glad. And last but not least, Jae Sung Lee asks, based on your field work and data, can you make any connections to why or how human beings became... Uh-oh, the last part of that is cut off. <laughs> slightly. How became to be? How humans beings became... There we hey! go. How humans... How why bipedal. humans became bipedal. <laughs> yeah, well, so this is the million dollar question. Um, mm. And I mean, one of the hallmarks of humanity is bipedalism. And I mean, there are all kinds of great things that humans can do. I mean, we have super dexterous hands, we have big brains, you know, we have you know, enormously complex social societies. But I mean, the hallmark of human bipedalism, one of the first things that we see in the fossil record is bipedalism. Wow. 
and you know, well, I think a lot of arguments in anthropology kind of focus on, okay, is that bipedalism exactly like you or I would walk around bipedalism, mm. or bipedally, is that bipedally, or is that form of bipedalism more like a chimpanzee, or maybe like a spider monkey or a macaque or some other kind of monkey? And there's a phenomenal amount of, of work and arguments that go back and forth on these points, but being bipedal is the first thing that happens um, in the human fossil record. And we still don't really know why that's the case, uh, which is enormously frustrating. Yeah, well, I can only <laughs> um, really imagine. Yeah, and I, I would say kind of the classical view on this is that you know early in, the, or kind of late in the Miocene, about eight million years ago in Africa, Africa became drier and drier, and we kind of went from these more tree-dwelling apes to actually walking around more on the ground. Now, that view has been more complicated, or has been kind of complicated in last years as we've been finding fossils that actually are from very forested <laughs> environments that yeah. st probably still were bipedal. Mm. So that's a good question. We still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> good. Um, but that's what we're trying Ultimately to figure out. And, and by kind of trying to figure out how bipedalism really works in these not quite human species, we're kind of getting ever closer to figure out why that might, mm. why a species might choose to stand on two legs instead of four. So, but, so the last thing we do right before we'll wrap up is the most important question, if you ask my opinion. Planet of the Apes. <laughs> is it possible? Should we be worried? I don't know. <laughs> I would say you probably shouldn't worry about it. Uh, oof, and I, I will say, thank God. and I will say it this way. <laughs> the idea of kind of super intelligent gorillas and chimps and orangutans working together probably is not ever going to happen. Oh. Orangutans are kind of in a different part of their world doing their own thing. Uh -huh. And they're at, actually at one of the parks we go to, there are gorillas and chimps, they coexist. Yeah. And they tend to leave each other alone. Oh. So I think the idea of them pairing up is probably not going to happen. Okay. All right. Well, you know. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully that we assuages any fear yeah. of, of that coming to fruition. It does. It does. <laughs> so, all right. Well, you, there's anyone else you'd like to Yeah. Thank? No, I just, I, yeah, like I said, I, you know, this project could only have been possible through a lot of uh, funders. The NSF has funded this project, and which has, has really allowed us to do a lot of this work, as has uh, the Leakey Foundation and Wintergreen Foundation as mm -hmm. well. Um, I have great collaborators, Shannon McFarlane at GW and Sergio Almethia at GW, um, Kelly Ostrowski, who's worked on this stuff. And yeah, we've had great collaborators in Africa. So I think I mentioned Max Planck Institute, um, the Institute for Tropical Forest Conservation and the Ugandan Wildlife Authority kind of made all this research possible. If, if not for their work and efforts, none of this would have happened. And similarly in Rwanda, um, the Diane Fossey uh, Gorilla Fund and um, the Rwandan Development Board really made this work possible and is really responsible for a lot of the conservation efforts in making sure these gorillas live on well into the future. Yeah, and uh, of course we'd like to thank NYITCon for Absolutely, everything yeah. that they can do for us and what they've done for us and all the research that we're going to be doing in the future. And we'd like to thank the summer research pro program that uh, Dr. Amsler allows us to do as well as the STEP program that allows us to work with students as well as, you know, medical students as well as high school students. Yeah. So. And if you still have questions or comments, just post Please. them. I'll go back. I'll go on Facebook right after this, and I'll answer any questions you have about human evolution or gorillas or anything else that you may have. Of course. So thank you All for right. your time. Thank you.